I said, no, I said, no, I'm not going to do it. Thanks. The offer. Sure. Shooting. Maybe a year later, boom, he's on MTV. Boom. It's mm-hmm. like, it was, it was a thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I said, but you know what, again, three years, maybe tops, not even that after that, Hey, so-and-so's not doing good. Hey, right. you know what I mean? And so I, I already knew I dodged the bullet on that one, but I, I saw it was in that, that, option was real the temptation and the choice it was it was real man Mm -hmm. yeah i definitely i definitely uh i wish that i had had more bullet dodges (laughs) i've gotten hit by the by that bullet a couple of a couple of times now Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And right off the bat, yeah, we did not put out one last week. Uh, I said that I think we have said before that we sometimes will not have the time during a fast or such to be able to put out an episode. So again, be expecting that um, nativity is coming up. So we'll probably miss a couple of weeks in there too. But uh, my name is Andrew and I'm your host. And I'm here to ask Cyprian and Father Turbo, what is something in music that uh, you hear and you're like, you're a sucker for like every time like um for me i was just talking about this with them uh i am really i love gang vocals it's a holdover from my punk days like just i love it when the whole band is singing um it 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 transfers for like all across all genres there's like this uh like band that came out that was pretty popular a couple years ago i'm not sure if they are anymore but uh this like icelandic pop indie band group called of monsters and men and they use gang vocals and like i just love it like it's just i don't know it's just something i'm super into in like i was just telling father and cyprian like it's even like a carly ray jepson song where the end ends with gang vocals and i just like it gives me goosebumps like every single time so and then interestingly enough, what my wife loves, the thing that gets her every time is when um, the bottom or, or like the midsection of a part of like a chorus will drop out and it's just like everybody clapping. So it's like, you know, the song Kitty um, uh by Mr. Mr. I think. Mm-hmm. Anyway, they're repeating the chorus. And then at one point, yeah. only the drums and the vocals and people clapping to the beat and but they're still yeah. singing the chorus and then they come back in yeah it's like my wife loves that every time like i know that that will get her so if i'm trying to get her into an artist and they have that i'm like start with that song because my wife will like that that's so. like an arena tactic that's what you yeah. do like in, in an arena that's a tactic that a band, that a band will do to get the crowd just going I absolutely love, insane yeah i love arena rock I can't mm-hmm. help it. Just like the over the top, the like crowds and crowds and crowds of people all singing. I don't know. I'm just into it. So mm-hmm. what about you I guys? Uh, mine is mine is as an electronic music guy, dance music guy. It's this it's this synth bass sound that's called a hollow bass. It's, it's hard to describe, but you would know it if you heard it, and it sounds like a hollow bass, but it's like, it's a this very unique synth sound, and it's like, um, like garage, house music. That's, there's something about it, like when I hear this particular sound, people could, people could Google it, like just Google hollow bass and hear it, and you'll be like, oh, I've heard that, and there's just something about it that is that is magical. Like if a song drops and that's in it, you've got me. I'm in. I'm that's fully cool. in. Yeah. That's cool. What about you, father? Man, just a brutal breakdown. 
Yeah, no, that's not, yeah, that's not a good one. Yeah. Just a brutal breakdown. Dun, 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 Hardcore, like it, metal. You like it when like the band breakdown. stops and the guitar is just like dun, 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 and then everybody comes like back in because like that's like one of my favorite breakdowns. I love it when like you can almost see it live and the guitarist is like standing on top of his amp and he's like chugs a couple times and everybody comes back in. Yeah, I mean, man, something about a good breakdown. Yeah. Breakdown. What's your favorite breakdown, Father? I mean, man, it's like, what's my favorite child? Um, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to pick, you know, but there's some bands who like, have some really really good breakdowns you know who's a band that's a really that's some really good breakdowns people don't know um i mean zayo has some incredible like the, bam, bam. when oh, they, the, the the squeak the two squeak and zayo has some incredible breakdowns uh living sacrifice has some incredible breakdowns too man i mean they're it's that what's interesting about the three things that we all said is that there's this element of negative space all about right? space. Yeah, it's it's the it's the negative space, and it's what we it's what we fill in. It's like it leaves the room for our spirit mm -hmm. to to fill something in. Well, I'm like, a bass player, you know. Oh well, there you go. Yeah. And I always when people are like, oh, make a good a good bass player. It's like you know, I'm gonna. <laughs> um, there was a band called Rancid from like. Oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. I I loved Operation Ivy, but like Rancid was just like you know. It, because the bass player, he plays too much, man. There's no space. No space. Everything's a fill. Everything, mm -hmm. Everything's a fill. For real. For to be real. a good bass player, you, a, a good bass player knows space and uses space. Yep. Hands, hands down. Well, that's the, that's the funk. That's a funk. Funk, oh, bass for sure. Player, right? Funk is all about, about what's, that space. Not, what's not being played. That's right. Oh. Right. It's the it's the it's the thing in the middle of of the bass notes that is that's like right. that's where and that's where everything's happening. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, Father, did you ever listen to War of Ages? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I've seen them a couple times. Yeah, yeah, that was. I don't know what's happening. Um, maybe it's boredom, but I have been like exploring some of that old like tangentially, like not like in a serious way, but like I've been listening to like some of the old like mid 2000s christian metalcore like mm -hmm. every once in a while i even like caught myself oh, i didn't catch myself because i i listened to as i lay dying for like mm -hmm. the first time in probably a decade and a half mm -hmm. and i was like yeah this is still pretty not good but it was like <laughs> yeah. I that i ended up there like i was like oh yeah this is this is neat you know i remember this it's funny i never really liked them <laughs> i I forced myself to because a bunch of people I hung out with really liked it. And I was just talking with a brother from the church not too long ago. There is one breakdown, speaking of breakdowns, that they have the song 94 Hours, which mm -hmm. guess what? You'll be finding that on the on the playlist. But I was listening to was it Sleeping Giant Father, the band that oh, you yeah. yeah. And it reminded me of War of Ages maybe just because it was breakdowns and christian yeah i mean you know they're you know face down records and they're yeah. kind of like you know i mean i saw them seen them play a couple times together so it's a, that's a thing yeah but uh hey no one asked me but i want to say it anyway lethargica by obs or by mashuga off obsent is by far the most brutal breakdown oh, like, yeah. of all time Mashuga's it's just great, like bow, no. Bound. it's just like non-stop just Show like a whole other thing i mean yeah you know what's weird is i've talked about this is like i have this problem and i don't know what it is but like nothing has ever been quite loud enough like it's never overtaken me like i've been to shows i've done like i've listened to music and like really good car stereo systems and everything like that nothing has like quite been there like right where i want it to be it's always like i went and saw mashuga live and stand stood where you're supposed to stand so that the music like the everything hits you right at this a good spot and i was like this is about eight out of ten it's still not quite loud enough like maybe i'm just waiting for like the angelic choirs to hit me when i get to heaven like then that'll find like scratch that itch i have inside or of me maybe maybe you're kind of deaf <laughs> Oh, I'm not I was, I was gonna now. say that. I was gonna say you might have some hearing. I loss. mean, I, I I have been to a couple of shows. I can tell you, like, 
Motorhead in like 90, I saw Motorhead in like 92, um, loudest show I've ever been to. I know everyone says it, but that thing, I mean, is is painful. Um, there was a, uh, what were they called? Um, they were an Atlanta band. Um, I was really into them for a while. Um, they were surprisingly loud. Like it, my ears were hurting really bad when I went and saw them. Um, it'll hit me later. Female singer and bass player. Um, oh, um, something thunder. Uh, not rolling thunder. Uh, anyways, they were they were very they were very painful. I've had I've had some shows where I've been like, man, you know, I got to put cigarette butts in my ear. Like like it was just. <laughs> Painful. Supposedly, painful. supposedly Meshuga is one of the loudest shows you can go to. Supposedly. And I don't know. I went and saw them and maybe it was the venue, but I don't think so because that's a pretty good venue. But I remember just being like, it's just not quite there yet. And I remember Cornerstone, they were shrieking, like shrieking, like hollow tinny, like mixes that hurt to listen to, but it wasn't the loud I wanted it to be. It wasn't like the wall of sound just like pummeling me like the way i wanted it to like i said probably just waiting for the angelic choirs of heaven to like set me on fire like that's probably what i'm really waiting for um no okay oh and then here's the other side of it here's something because you know we're just kind of hanging out like i don't know if we have a real set agenda tonight but we're just gonna what is the thing that immediately turns you off from a song Ooh. yeah i can name something right off the bat it even though morrissey does it quite a bit and i'm a huge big morrissey fan i hate i hate it when people rhyme a word with that same word like they'll be like like there's a oh. slipknot line from a long time ago where he says like i'm just looking for some direction i'll just look i'm just looking for any kind of direction and every time i hear someone do something like that i just like I cannot stand it. I just am like, it, it's an instant turn off for me. Even though Morrissey does it all the time, I don't know why it's okay when he does it. But I, I also hate clap tracks. And I hate, like, I don't like, like, trap beats a lot of the time. Like, I don't like the really thin electronic sounding, like, symbol, like the, you know, nine times out of ten, if you hear somebody pulling up on you with really loud hip-hop playing, like, the type of, like, I don't know, like, eight, you're talking about eight you're talking about you don't like the sound of an 808 drum machine because that's pretty no, much no, no, what no, no, that's no. pretty much what you're hearing i love me an 808 okay. i love i love me an 808 i'm talking about a very specific type of like i don't know exactly how to and i can't think of a song off the top of my head that does it ah. but the beastie boys use an 808 i love 808 like 808's legit but yes. no it's it's more modern than that like it's it sounds like right well nobody actually uses an 808 drum machine anymore right it's like okay it's then a, maybe it's a kit and then they'll like they'll they'll tune it differently you know so, what i mean but it's yeah it's real it's it's the 808 sound probably just limited in a way that you don't like it right it's so maybe that's what it in is a weird way yeah. maybe that's what it is yeah well i mean when you go from the original machine the original machine is so like it's it's totally different like a digital a, a digital emulator of an 808 does not sound like an 808 drum machine like when you lay the two of them next to each other you can totally tell the difference and and you that might just the be whole it. thing about was it kanye that was talking i think it was kanye mm. <laughs> that was talking about the uh i don't know how you phrase it the evil vibes that gets put out because of the dissonance with the 808 have you heard this before no no but it doesn't surprise me yeah yeah <laughs> what are your thoughts on that father i mean yeah frequency is a whole thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. frequency is a whole thing yeah i mean clearly clearly i mean otherwise we otherwise we wouldn't be chanting oh yeah, yeah. that's true Damn. i mean it matters it, it matters, matters. It matters you guys have a particular turn off if not we can just move on i can't i can't think of one but i know that there is i think it's just one of those you know it when you hear it i there are de there's definitely music that immediately will or songs whatever that will immediately turn me off 
One of the things that's an immediate turnoff for me is if you do basically like a note for note cover. Oh, this, no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the one because they're doing it all the time. Every time I turn on the radio, it's a cover, but you've gone and you've changed the lyrics, but not so much. Like you've changed them like 65% so that I'm like, whoa, you even copied the lyrics, but you basically just like changed them a little bit. But now you're doing a very poor cover of a song. That's a great song. And mm-hmm. then it's on the radio. It's mm-hmm. like oh, a new hit song. And I'm like, off like turning it off not that i listen to the radio all that often but on occasion i will turn it on bad plagiarism yeah that's it bad plagiarism if you're gonna do a cover like i love a great cover but do it it's a cover you're doing the exact song and you're doing it like well yeah you're oh putting so your you own like thing it people, on it you don't like it when people take a spin on it I'm, it's, it's not a spin that I'm talking about, right? Like you could do something musically that's a spin, but you like, I know that it's a cover and you're, you know, but something where you're like almost trying to confuse somebody who's maybe never heard the song and mm. confuse them into believing it's your song when it's quite clearly a cover. Of, I wish I could think of an example of this, but it's happening so much in pop music right now. Like have so you, much. Have you, have you ever heard Butthole Surfers is uh cover of american woman no but that sounds amazing it's like like amazing in the loosest sense of the word a cover i think they say some of the lyrics like like and i think he just like grabs a mic and puts it through a bullhorn and then another bullhorn and then another mic and records it into like a fisher price like child like not actually he doesn't actually do this but it sounds like he's just screaming into this like really awful And then what father said, I hate overplaying like Tim Armstrong from Rancid or whatever. Yeah. Like Maxwell murders was cool when you were like 13 and you had never heard someone play bass like that before. But I mean, look at Les Claypool, who's an amazing bass player. And he, he, you know, there are times where he shows off, but more often than not, he plays in a way that works with the rest of the band. He's not just like, like all the time. There's this really awful, in my opinion, awful band, bluegrass band called Trampled by Turtles. And what a name. Yeah. It's, and the mandolin player will just not chill out every time. I don't know if it's a he or she or whatever, but they're just like nonstop, like, like power metal shredding, like the mandolin, like nonstop. And I'm like, dude, just like the rest of the band is going at like a four and you're going at like a 16. Just chill out. It's not a big deal that maybe that's a mandolin player thing because i knew i once knew this guy who happened to play the mandolin and and nobody liked him and i didn't like and i I didn't like him either man that's a good that's a good shirt like quote i once knew a guy who played the mandolin ellipses and no one liked no no one liked this no one liked this dude man he was like he was a he was an outcast, but he, and he always wanted to make friends. I said, this is when I was a motorcycle courier. And he, I remember this, I was just eating lunch one time, hanging out where all the couriers hang out. And he sat down and was talking. And then he was, I was like, oh, maybe this dude is cool. He's like, he's super friendly, whatever. He was like, oh, we should hang out sometime. Invited me, invited me. Oh, this is it. Invited me over to his place. He was like, oh, come by, man. Have, have a couple drinks. I live in this cool neighborhood. Come by. He did live pretty close to me. I came by, he was like, cool, here, here's a beer. I sat down and he was like, ah, let me show you something. And what did he do? He stood up, he grabbed a freaking mandolin. And played and Wonderwall? He, dude, he kept playing for like 45 minutes on this mandolin while I'm like a prisoner. Ooh. I was done with my beer. <laughs> and, so I'm saying maybe this is just a thing with people who play mandolins. And after that, they were like, oh, he, everybody else was like, ah, I saw you talking to him the other day. Did he invite you over? I was like, yeah. Did he trap you there and play the mandolin? I was like, yeah. They're like, ah, you got got. He gets everybody that way. And everybody just, that's why everybody just ignores him. Because he did that to so many people. There, I was talking about a situation similar to that. And it was like, I'm not going to name names. It was a brother from the church was talking about someone we all used to know. And this person busted out an acoustic guitar at a campfire oh boy. and was singing and then like threw in casually, 
do you guys mind if I play a song I wrote real quick? And then like the guy said he did a thing, which is classic. I'm gonna have to start doing it where he took a drink of his beer and started coughing. Like it went down the wrong pipe and just walked away and then come back. And it was like, that's perfect. Like that's perfect. A perfect way of handling that. Anyway, father, you got any thoughts or do you want to move on? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I don't have a topic other than I wanted to ask father about this. Um, and then we have a couple questions. Um, but I, there's this book, Way of the Ascetics, um, by Tito Coleander. Okay, cool. Um, and then there's this line. This is from chapter five on the denial of the self and the cleansing of the heart. So I want to read this and then I want to kind of for like just a second. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I kind of wanted to um, say what my thoughts were on it and like kind of how this quote has changed changed meaning for me and then kind of get what the like more or less correct way of seeing it is from father um so this is at the end of the chapter and he says at the end but if you are fearful of becoming self-righteous from working for your own or let me start over i'm sorry but if you're fearful of becoming self-righteous from working for your own salvation or afraid of becoming overcome by spiritual pride Examine yourself and observe that the person who is afraid of becoming self-righteous suffers from blindness, for he does not know how self-righteous he is. So, Father, are you with me so far? Okay. So, um, at first, I thought this was a good thing. I th at first, I thought he was saying, if you're afraid of becoming self-righteous, you are righteous. And it doesn't seem like that's what he's saying, Father. Do you need me to read it again? Are you familiar with the quote? I'm familiar with the quote, but read it okay. again. I'm familiar okay. with the quote, read it again. Mm -hmm. But if you are fearful of becoming self-righteous from working for your own salvation or afraid of becoming overcome by spiritual pride, examine yourself and observe that the person who's afraid of becoming self-righteous suffers from blindness for he does not know how self-righteous he is. Now it kind of seems like a burn. Now it kind of seems like because I'm a burn. afraid. Of, yeah, it is a burn. Because I was afraid of becoming self-righteous. I was like, how i like i was like i don't want to do too much because if i do too much i might become self-righteous and is so i kind of wanted to get your thoughts on this father because there's a couple different ways of looking at it and from my perspective and I, it seems like it's a good thing to be afraid of becoming self-righteous but maybe i'm missing the point yeah so one way to really kind of have like hit it head on is if you've um, if anyone's ever read any of the divine, uh, the latter divine ascent by St. John Clomicus and the, uh, the work on Banglory, it's pretty brutal because, you know, every which way you turn, you're being Banglorious. <laughs> like it's, it's, and, and what you're left with is this resignation of um, you can't, you can't get yourself out of the loop. You see what I'm saying? And, and this, is, this is one of the core things that's running through any ascetic literature of the churches. Um, any inclination towards um, doing something in of your own strength, that, that in essence, like you don't even begin to cook until you learn that truly. Not like, because what he's talking about is this affect of people like speaking about it, but it's like you have to really know that you truly, <laughs> you can't do anything on your on your own, like like you can't, right? And there's a there's a, it's not a resignation, it's a it's an actual humility where it doesn't even come into play, because you wreck you, the awareness of your wretchedness, um, and and that you're you are fundamentally proud at that sense like that type of realization doesn't even entertain those types of questions anymore you know what i mean like a person who's a person who a person who's who's who knows themselves they don't even they're not even going to go down this road of it's kind of a game what he's what he's pulling out is there's this game that people will play um, and you see it all the time. It's, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, 
you know, I, I've said before at times like, and that's why you need a savior, you know, like, oh, this, this, and this, X, Y, Z, you know, that's, I'm like, yeah, that's why you need a savior. Or like, I'll give another example, man, you know, I, I third week of Lent or whatever, man, I, I really just, I failed so hard. I was all excited, but then it was like, I broke the fast. I've been praying, blah, blah. I said, okay, great. Now you're ready to actually, now you get it. You know what I mean? It's now you actually really get it because all those illusions that you actually were going to do something in the first place, like you, <laughs> like, and, like, and again, and, and again, it, it, it's, it's an authentic, not like, Hey, I, I don't want to be, you know, proud, like wink, wink. It's like, you know what it is? Uh, I'll never forget. Um, and this is gonna this is gonna scandalize some people, but I I'll never forget. I was when I was you know working uh, at RS whatever. There's a cat who I used to I made acquaintance with, heroin addict, and uh, he was a Pentecostal pastor at one point in time. All this and that, you know. Him and I would have some really, really interesting talks about spirituality um, and Christ and things like that. And um, this was a man who there was no guile in him. There was no, like, when he was talking, when we were talking about God and Christ and everything, talking with him, I had more authentic conversations of experience than some people who are like, you know, quote unquote, hitting all the pious buttons. And I'm gonna tell you why. This guy had lost his wife, his children, his like lost everything, jaundice in the eyes. I mean, he's, he's a junkie on the street, right? There is no illusion of like <laughs> righteousness or like he can't even, the thought of even being worried about that doesn't even enter his mind because Unlike everyone else, he just looks in the mirror and sees the reality. See, most people, they don't have that luxury. They can go, I got a job. I go to church. I pray. I do this and that, right? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. It's like if you're asking you a question, you've already lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it makes more sense. And as I was kind of reading it this time, I was like, I think I actually kind of, I think I needed to read it aloud. Mm -hmm. because that's a problem sometimes is because i think i have it i think i'm reading something kind of a certain way and then the minute i read it aloud it seems to make a little bit more sense so no yeah that's good um okay so then i had another question from that was sent to me and i told the, the gentleman that i would read it um so this is about that youtube video that i had discussed a little while ago about elder elder ephraim of arizona where he talks about the young woman who had the abortion and went to heaven or, or basically never confessed it led like a you know a pious life but she never confessed it and then um demons when she died she basically had this really good relationship with the mother of god um and when she died she was being dragged to hell um and she cried oh, right, out, figured it out. Christ, yeah, like Christ figured it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is regarding this. So um, let me see a good place to start. Okay, he says um, he's okay. So he's got a stumbling block. A couple of episodes ago, you discussed a saint. Uh, I don't think she was a saint. I think she's just a regular person. But uh, discussed a person that had died outside of grace, but was brought back to life to allow her time to repent. I think there's actually two stories getting mixed up here, but the, the central question is the same. It was said that the Holy Mother Mary interceded and changed God's mind about his initial judgment, or that is the way it sounded. Please forgive me if I'm putting words into your mouth. Please ask Father to help me understand why this notion of intercession specifically, uh, uh, Father, to help me understand why this notion of intercession specifically i have trouble understanding a dichotomy that I perceive that I'm perceiving that God's judgment is both infallible and subject to change based on intercession. It is giving me a hard time. Do you understand the question? Because I know I stumbled a little bit. Yeah, I mean, if I'm understanding it, he's struggling with the, with the reality that um, 
If God is infallible, how come he changed his mind? Yes. And that intercession, because there's, there's this really interesting reality that mercy triumphs over judgment. <laughs> and um, I think the problem, the problem lies in, in a couple of areas. I mean, the, the first thing is that um, God doesn't des desire the death of the sinner. So God doesn't want anyone to perish. And much of what much of what people encounter in regards of their um, being kind of entrapped are things that are fundamentally of their own doing. Right. So when you under when you understand that and you understand that that God, Saint Zephroni, he talks about how, um, which is another great example of how what, like our tradition, our saints talk about God versus outside of our tradition. Because when you, when you read elders and saints, they talk about God from the Orthodox perspective and tradition, the emphasis is always on God's like humility, his wisdom, like all these things versus outside of it, it's like, you know, God's judgment, like these, these very rigid and the kind of, they're always filtered through our human experience and understanding, right? Because we're, <laughs> there's this great song actually um, by 16 Horsepower called Black Soul Choir, great song. And uh, in the verse, he says, basically, um, um, He says, you know, basically he's talking about sins. For my own sins, I feel great shame. Um, then he says this great line. He says, I would offer up a brick to the back of your head. He's like, I would offer up a brick to the back of your head, boy, if I was king. And what he's talking about is, if it's up to me, I'm smashing heads. I'm, I'm, you're done, you're done, you're done. But he's talking about in the light of it, like God is, that's not how God works. God's mercy is, it's, it doesn't make sense to us. It's foolish to us, right? Interestingly enough, this is getting close to what I'm talking about here because let me give you another example. Uh, do you know the parable the Lord gives about the servants, the ones who come in the morning, the ones who come in the midday, the ones who come in the late evening, right? Mm -hmm. And the ones who came in the morning or in the midday, whatever, they look and they see that the people that came in the end of the day gets paid the same amount of money as they did. And they're like, what's the deal with this? That's not fair. And the master says, friend, he says, friend, friend, why are you upset? Because I'm generous, right? So the thing that we have to really look at is it's not some like, yes, God's judgment is infallible, but there's a whole mechanism there that you're missing, which is primarily understanding that God doesn't, God doesn't send people to hell. They choose to be there. They, this is what I was trying to get at. They put themselves in that situation to their circumstances that have brought them there. You know, God, God has his, you know, yes, he's righteous and his judgment, all these things, but like the, the final judgment what that woman experienced is not the final judgment, it's the particular judgment. And that, that particular judgment, it's all about, you know, where she has placed herself at. Does that make sense? Sure. So, so when we say like, oh, if God's infallible, God's infallibility has nothing to do with that woman's judgment. Her judgment is because of her unrepented, um, unatoned for sins in that sense, right? And it's just, God's like, you know, God shows himself in that he, he desires for her, you know, he hears his holy mother and her heart to see, to have, to have mercy. You know what I'm saying? So it's not really a matter of the infallibility. That's not even a, a part of the equation. Well, it seems, it seems that there's like, um, and you mentioned it there, father, there's, there seems to be an undertone to, to this. And it's, it's related to something even in the last couple of days with this whole like student loan forgiveness thing, right? 
where even my first impression of what this was, because I hadn't paid attention to student loans in 10, 15 years, uh, was wrong. I thought the banks were involved, but it's the government and all of this. And I was corrected online. And thank you to the person who did that. But it still is, it's, it's, in some ways, it's even worse. But what I thought was interesting was the people who were opposed to it and the reason that they were opposed to it, not for economic reasons, it's going to create inflation, whatever. It's a bailout to, to cronies. It's to, it's to in academic, the academic institution, the interest, and it's going to make things go up. No. So for, for most of them on the political side, it was like the people who paid off their student loans and did the right thing are not getting, like they're, they get nothing out of this, right? And it's like, correct they get nothing out of this and that's what they were upset about mm -hmm. they're like so you're telling me mm -hmm. the people who did the right thing who mm -hmm. paid who paid on time who mm -hmm. did all of this they're not getting anything mm -hmm. out of this and these people who who aren't aren't having to pay and so like this is what i see as go as like underneath it is that is that there's this like there's the word judgment is being used, but I think the word like that, what they're seeking is justice. Mm -hmm. And I think like, it's the human interpretation of justice mm -hmm. as opposed to God's God's justice. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's St. Paisios. And yeah. I used to pull that one on my kids. It worked for a while and they got hit to it, but I was like, which one do you want? You want human justice or you want divine justice? Right. And they started learning if they picked human justice, it never was good for them. And they picked divine justice. It was like mercy, you know what I mean? So they got hip to it, but it's like, that's, that's in Paisios. And it's, it's true, you know, we, this is part of that changing of the mind, that, that repentance. This is, this is really great because this moralism thing um, and, and really kind of moving out of the, and there is a moral aspect to repentance, obviously. There is a moral aspect to our faith, obviously but it can't be the whole core thing. Here's why. <clears throat> because if you have just that view of repentance in regards to moralistic sense, you're looking at specific events, right? And this is where you've, I've heard some people, God help them. I don't need to repent of any, you know, what I need to repent of, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yikes, like you don't get it, you know? And what I'm trying to get at is there's a whole, it's like, a, it's a wave being. You know what I mean? It's it's a way of being, of understanding the way that this world works. Um, it, I mean, it's the Beatitudes, right? I know I didn't get into it, but like mercy, right? Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Like this, this aspect of if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven and what that means, not only do you have to reject the precepts of this world, that's not enough. You also need to embrace the precepts of the kingdom of God. Mercy is not a precept that belongs to this world. It belongs to the kingdom of God, right? Interestingly enough, the last toll house is mercilessness. That's the, that's the very last toll house where a lot of people stop, right? Mercilessness. This insight into the kingdom of heaven, it should be powerful for us because all you got to do is take a look around, look at your, turn on the news, Fox or NBC, same thing. The, there's a lack of mercy, right? So for the left and the way that worked out, a lack of mercy, right? It wasn't about justice. It became about being revenge, right? Mm -hmm. Fill in the blank, fill in whatever oppressed minority group. You know what I mean? Boom, right? But on the right, it's the same thing. You know what I mean? I'm I did this, and this, and I did the right thing. Why am I not right? And and what that is, that's the older brother in the prodigal son, who's like, why are you throwing a a party for that scumbag brother of mine? I've never left you, father. And it's like, yeah, you're never with me, really, because everything I've had is yours, and you're and here you are. I, you know what I mean? It's like you have it and you're not even participating in it because you're so stuck on your, you know, overdeveloped sense of justice. You see what I'm saying? And it's it's really sad because, you know, the bitterness that people find themselves existing in 
because of these things, you know, it's, it, it robs them of, it robs them of what little bit they do have, you know? So then I'm sorry, I'm a little dense. Is she standing? <laughs> she's standing before the court and we're going back to this woman. Yeah. Um, and God has said, you know, according to this, this account, there's nothing I can do. Mm-hmm. And then the mother of God said, come on, mm-hmm. come on. And he's like, okay, there's this one thing we can do. Mm-hmm. Like, I guess I, and I, and I share in it from a, a certain part of me shares in the confusion. Another part of me is, well, he's God, he does what he wants, you know, like, but like, you know, the part of me that shares in the confusion is just like, if he's all perfect, and which he is, of course, if, if he's all perfect, all wise, and he is. Mm -hmm. then how come he needed someone to change his mind or to convince him of something? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like how, how come, I mean, is he that much of a person? Well, first you have to define perfection. First you have to define perfection, right? Because the assumption that you're making is you're assuming that the ability to change one's mind is not an aspect of perfection. Right. You're 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 assuming that that's not that that's not included in perfection, right, because we can change our minds and that's a good thing. Like if we're corrected for us to change our minds, that's a good thing. And we're made in the image of God. So how how is that not an aspect of God? Maybe I'm asking that to you, Father, if if like if I'm on the right path there. Yeah, I mean, I would say the first thing is don't downplay what I'm trying to say here about. It's not the it's not the great judgment. It's not the final judgment. Like that that's super important to understand. Okay. There's a finality in the in the great judgment which people aren't don't fathom. They don't fathom. And by proxy of that, they don't fathom that this is this is one of the things about, you know, when you becoming when you become orthodox the, in our context, right? Um, God plays chess, not checkers. It's, I see it over, over and over again, the strategic placing of why does this one person in the family come to the church and everyone else is whatever? Because that one person becomes an anchor point by which the mercy of God is able to be disseminated. See, the thing is, is that, and I'll get to that, but just bear with me on this. Like, God doesn't violate and he'll, he doesn't violate our free will, right? I've said this before, but he'll use a back door if he can. That's where, that's where the, the, um, the necessity that he places on us to pray, this is, where, this is where that mystery comes into play. Because your, let's say, you know, your family member or whatever is totally walled off to God. Well, it's nothing to do with God. Okay, God's not gonna violate their free will, right? but he will use you as a means to get to the back door of their heart, right? And if you take that one step further, we can and should be praying for our loved ones who have passed on outside of the faith, outside of like, if you're an Orthodox person and if if you're a convert and the rest of your family is not Orthodox, you need to see that as your sacred solemn duty to be praying for your loved ones who have who are not only <clears throat> now alive and don't know Christ, don't know the church, but the ones who have passed on because it matters, right? The church has, tells us over and over and over again that those intercessions matter. Even if someone dies outside the faith, right? Pray for them, right? So I, that the confusion and the kind of like almost theotic type question comes up because you don't understand that context of it's not the final judgment, right? So, so when God says, well, there's nothing I can do, what is he saying? He's not saying like, oh gosh, I'm befuddled. You know what I mean? Okay. What it is is like, look, these are principles. Like, I don't even need to judge her. She judges herself, right? St. Paisius talks about this too. He says, well, the judgment is like God's silent. He's like, 
he he describes it almost like people will see it like, like people are looking at a video screen and they see their they see themselves it's like god doesn't have to say anything you're judging yourself the scriptures talk about this too about our own conscience to, to judging us right so you have to kind of get this portion i'm talking about because it changes everything because it because the thing of like well how many angels can dance on the pin you know the head of a pin like which isn't a thing by the way <laughs> but that that kind of questioning we have to this is why developing an orthodox mindset is so important because you almost don't even ask those questions anymore because it's like you you start understanding that like oh god it, it's not a matter of like god's like huh oh i don't get it it's like you understand that God, of course, doesn't want her to be condemned, right? But she's made these choices and they're like, you know, so it, it's almost like, well, what, what, do you, what do you want me to do, right? I see. That that helps a little bit more. It helps a little bit more because it's... It's almost, it's almost like there's nothing, it's, it's like saying, because I picture the king and it's like, there's nothing, there's nothing I can do. Right. It's almost like the next move is for someone else. Right. right. It's not it's not to say that there's nothing that can be done. Right. But it's to say, here's the principle. Here's the way the kingdom works. Mm -hmm. I'm the king. There's nothing that I can do. But just to say there's nothing I can do doesn't mean there's not anything that the mother of God can that she doesn't still have a role. It doesn't mean that this woman still doesn't have a role. It doesn't mean that the angels don't still have a role. It doesn't mean that her patron saint doesn't still have a role. She can't like, change. God's not going to, God, God can't change in that way. He's not going to, you know what I mean? God's not going to break laws or like principles. Like he's, he's not going to do that. He's not going to do that. And interestingly enough, no laws or principles are broken by the mother of God interceding either. That's right. That's why we, we, we step back and we go like, oh man, Jesus is just like, that's why we worship him. Because it's like, you did it again, right? That's, remember the story, and the demons are confounded. They're like, how did you do it, right? Because he does in such a way, is, there's no, there was no accusation against Christ. You're a cheater. No, you're a cheater, right? All that the, all that the fallen ones can do, all that anyone could do is step back. And that's why, I'm, for me, I'm just like, I don't know how he's going to do it. When I look, when I look at, when I look at the world, when I look at, you know, quote unquote, folks in the church, I go, how are you going to do it, Lord? You know what I mean? Like, how are you going to work all this out? And everyone's going to step back and be like, that, that's the final act. And everyone steps back and they're like, hallelujah. Like, like, Lord, like everyone's, every knee will bow and tongue will confess. Not because he's there like a tyrant being like, I'm I'm the one with the bigger gun. You're gonna kneel. That's that's not it, right? Every knee will bow, right? Because everyone's gonna step back, and there will be no doubt. His wisdom, his wonder, his goodness. Like this is why you we <laughs> we need to get in the practice of it now. Stop seeing the difficult things in your life as a problem, because when you start to see it as God's hand you start worshiping God, you start like, wow, it, it's, who cares if God can work, work something out easy that you could have done yourself? Who cares, right? The fact that he can do something that's impossible, right? That's why he's God. Like, man. And there's no like, oh, you're a cheater. That, that's. Yeah. Well, it's not a deus ex yeah. machina. Like he doesn't come in and like violate right. his own rules just to like, or introduce some new thing that was less to like left of the last act to be like, oh, here's this brand new rule, by the way, that we're introducing so that all the rules that have been in, you know, or whatever, since the beginning of time, all suddenly don't matter anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. But so. this is the, this is divine order versus what man, when man tries to construct order, you know? So it's like, and it, and it's, it's how you say, He's not standing there with a with a gun because that's what we're seeing is that people are like oh things are things are disordered things are disordered and what i just hear over and over and over again is not well 
let's pray, let's get closer to God, let's get closer to the divine order so that the things that are so that the things that are of God, that those miraculous things can happen. It's like, well, that's not going to do it. That's the answer. Like, that's not going to do it. We have to plan it out ourselves in our heads. And I'm like, well, I'm an engineer. So I know that you're going to introduce fatal bugs. I know that because, because you don't even think of it. You just started thinking about these things like two years ago. You know what I mean? As opposed to here's 2000, 10,000 years, right? If we want to go back to, to, you know, the prefiguring of Christ, it's like 20,000, whatever the amount is like millennia of here's the experience, do this. And the things will happen like in the time that they're supposed to happen with divine order, as opposed to not no, we need order of the kind that I say, like we need justice of the kind that I say. I mean, I see it all the time. It drives me absolutely up a wall that I, 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 when I work with people, especially people in like recovery and, you know, they start feeling themselves after a couple of months or whatever. And then they'll be like, I just don't really believe that, you know, this is something I need to do, whatever spiritual step it may be. And I'll say like, you have it backwards. Like you think you need to feel an experience and then move forward, like do the thing and the knowledge will come. And like, well, that's, that's never been the case in my life ever. It's like, really? So you've never smoked the meth knowing that the feeling was going to come later on. You never did that, right? You never like drank the liquor knowing the feeling was going to come later on. You didn't do that. You did the action in faith knowing that like the experience was going to happen. Why is this a problem? And the problem is, is because like for, I mean, on an emotional level, spiritual level, blah, blah, blah. It's because it's a decreasing of the ego rather than an increasing of the ego. Like they get flattened. And I mean, by the way, I just want to say a subtext seems like so far a, a, a below the surface theme to this episode is blessed are the poor in spirit. I mean, because I mean, like here's, here's, are you willing to be knocked down, dragged out and truly admit that you really have no power over your life other than, you know, the power that God's given you? Like, are you really willing to admit that like, there is nothing you can do to save yourself. And if you can rely on your orders, on your way of ordering the universe that you- That's the thing have. right there is that like getting even into like blessed and what does that even mean? Because the biggest obstacle to it from my perspective to even entering into it is people don't understand what that means. Their, their concept of it has everything to do with a very sensual, ego-driven, um, pleasure-driven, um, small-mindedness of like reward. You know what I mean? Re reward in, 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 a, in, a, in a temporal sense. Like treat please. Treat yeah, please. yeah, it, it's, you have, to, you have to kind of move beyond that Really, in fact, I'm like you have to really kind of almost have a disdain for that to really to really understand what what the Lord is saying there, and then to even begin to like experience it because this whole you know um, hedonistic way of being of just everything is about pursuing pleasure, right? It it is you know it's the fundamental flaw. In, in in us as you know if you can hear me you're probably american or westerner like it's in us it's in us you know and it <clears throat> it's antithetical to the spiritual life and so you know it's interesting I, I i had the wonderful privilege of spending um part of my uh morning with uh with a woman who's um moved recently here and um she's originally from from egypt and i i don't get i don't get the opportunity to speak as often as i would like with with people who are from outside the u.s um and it's always such a great reminder of like oh yeah we're so messed up like we're so fundamentally not human <laughs> you know what i mean like like it, it's interesting because just on her base level don't get me wrong she's this amazing woman whatever but just on a fundamental just 
base level on like culture and how <clears throat> we function. That's why God, thank God he's merciful. It's so hard for us to, to get Christianity. Like we all understand this, but the Christianity that, that you get over here, it's not Christianity. You know what I mean? People it's transactional. It's transactional. It's yeah. so weird. Um, and so it, it's really, really tough. And I say that charitably to like all of us who are converts. It's like, and God knows it's like, it's extra hard for us. You know what I mean? I say that for people not to be discouraged, but encouraged. God knows. And thank God he's merciful. Thank God, like, we don't want him to be exacting in his justice because we're the last people who aren't going to make it. You know what I mean? Um, but it's, it's, our life is so antithetical. So it's, and this is why, you know, man, I, evangelical, the evangelical mindset, the American evangelical mindset, which is what most people kind of have in some weird sense, one way or the other, it's so twisted. And it's, it's, the, also the reason why so many people you don't blame them for leaving quote unquote Christianity because it, because there's this weird dissonance that you automatically run into if you try to take this thing seriously if you try to take Christ seriously and you're an evangelical one of two things happen you either leave evangelicalism or even Christianity on the whole or you start living this weird lie I know it feels like an absolute statement. I'm gonna stand by it because you end up in this thing where it's like, I love Jesus, you know, whatever that means. And I'm just trying to do my best. I'm gonna be a good soldier, but you don't talk about those things. You know what I mean? There's certain, and that's why, here's, here's the big reveal. That's why when someone converts and they kind of go through this process, You'll never, <laughs> evangelical churches don't teach church history for a reason. They don't, like, it's all about, the, what about the verses that aren't highlighted? What about the verses that aren't underlined in your Bible? What about all the things that, like, the vast majority of scripture that's never given in a sermon? What about What about, that? What about just reading a gospel through as, as the narrative as it was written, as the story of Christ in his ministry? Mm -mm. Never happened. In, it never happens because... Church. Because it's, and, I'm, and believe it or not, I'm trying to be charitable, because it, our society and our culture is, is antithetical at a, on a fundamental level, right? Like, that's why, if you're being real honest, you can run into people from a place like Lebanon or Cairo or like wherever, and it's like, they may not even be Christians, but they have more of a Christian kind of like ethos. How does that work, right? Because on a broader social level, we are so fundamentally materialistic, hedonistic, all the things I already mentioned, right? Broken record. So like all that being said, how do you get out? And I think that I think that's why you, you and I were talking about this earlier, Cyprian. It's these weird Cyruses. They're like, they're Cyruses. They're like, like Andrew Tate, he's like a King Cyrus. Jordan Peterson, he's like a King Cyrus. These like kind of wicked kings are, are being used by God to, to kind of crack a shell. But the problem is, is people, they don't, they're not really taking the opportunity and they're, they're staying too long. It's, it's like the, the kind of loop is broken. They break this loop and they're like, something's fundamentally wrong, right? Um, and then you have this opportunity where you can jump out of the plane at a certain altitude and survive. But they're too scared ah, to jump out of the altitude. Saying, father. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And so they, they hang on and it's just like, they, it's like, no, you, no. Like, you understand what I'm saying? You got to jump out yeah, while so, you can. So, it, it, yeah, this, this, that's a, it's a wonderful articulation because this is, what I've, this is what I've been feeling. It's almost like if things were in order, Jordan Peterson or Andrew Tate could never would never even appear on your radar. Never. If they were <laughs> there, there would there would Andrew Tate could not have gone viral if things were good, if things were in order. 
No. He can only go viral because – and the thing is, like, both him and Jordan Peterson, because there's this kernel of truth in what they say, right? Mm-hmm. There's this kernel of truth of, like, oh, yeah, those things that they're saying, yeah, that is actually messed up. Mm-hmm. Like, their description has enough of this that they're pointing out, like, the emperor has no clothes. Mm-hmm. But then they've got their game is then they've got a prescription Mm -hmm. that is like, now worship me. That's right. Now worship me. That's right. Right. Because, because you can't worship anybody else. Right. Or, or worship yourself. Cause that, that's even better. Even better. That's really the thing that I think I want to point to because it's like, worship yourself. Cause I worship myself. You know what I mean? And, and, and Andrew Tate is an apologist for that. Yeah. So he's like, worship yourself and then keep coming because you keep coming back because you're like, should I be worshiping myself? And he's like, worship, yes, look, <laughs> boom, 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 all day long. I'm going to tell you to worship yourself, worship yourself, worship yourself. Yeah. 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 You guys, <clears throat> do you guys know Ryan Long, the comedian? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's super funny. Yeah. He is very poignant. He does a, a episode on the guy who acts like Andrew Tate at home. And like, he's saying like, this whole thing he's like i get up every day i get that grind and this girlfriend's standing like off camera she's like you work for your dad's lawn scaping like lawn like scaping business and sometimes you don't even show up like and she's like i pay our rent like what do you and he I just if i have a criticism if he has a failing is that sometimes the skits go on a little bit long but like he really nails this whole problematic approach that that you know and i mean I'm not on the internet that much. So I didn't know who the, I was really about to drop a hard F bomb. <laughs> like, I don't know who Andrew Tate was up until like maybe a month ago. No, nobody did though. That's the point. Really? Cause I usually, yeah, no, no, no. He just, he appeared out of, he appeared out of nowhere. Yeah. But I will, it's interesting because it's, it's, he's a herald. <laughs> he is a herald. He's a herald. Indeed. And it, and it's, you know, and he's pointing, he's pointing these things out and the timing, which he's pointing them out. Is, is really particular and it's it's interesting again because he's pointing to something in regards of order mm-hmm. right hierarchy mm-hmm. these things that are just natural that were so far gone that it takes you know it takes someone on the periphery to kind of like get your attention to point back mm-hmm. you know um well, his, his message, like his entire message, even about how he made his money, and this is the reason why, he, he, for better or worse, like people point out, you know, our physical similarities, but also there's the, these similarities in our story, but also there's, the simil- there's a similarity in like mindset of where I was, let's say at probably 33, 34 years old. Um, go ahead. I just got to say something really quick. Go. That- satanist leader from south africa or whatever <laughs> yeah we got your anti-father turbo okay we got our anti-cyprian i just got to Wait, find out who the anti-andrew he's is coming now. he's coming yeah. don't worry he's coming <laughs> the I, this, or this, go I ahead can fly low enough beneath the radar that like it doesn't happen that's probably more than likely what's going to happen no it's coming i, I just got to find it's out it's go ahead, coming Jimmy. well the you know, his message, it's very interesting because his message is, it's incredibly true, but it's incredibly cynical to where he's like, hey, listen, you can, ins- the world is falling apart, but you can insulate yourself if you're rich. The rich will be insulated. Now, there's some truth to that. Like, you will be the last to fall materially, right? But you will not be insulated spiritually. So he's like, look, listen. You can be materially insulated. And then he's like, and because how he made all his money, it's like how you're going to make your money. How, what you're going to do is you are basically going to take all of the all of the resources of the people who are not as smart and not as hardworking of you. And, and you're going to use their vices against them. Mm-hmm. Right. Because he how did he make his money by running these cam girl sites? Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like fundamentally, how did he make his money off off men? who were more hard up than, and he just realized, oh, here's all these men out, out here, right? And then he's, he's also like manipulating the women to take the money from the men, right? So it's like a typical pimp scenario, but it's like, I look back and it's like, 
wow, my mind was absolutely there because you, it's the hatred of mankind that you have when you're in that, because you, you have to hate everybody to, to mm -hmm. do that. And it, it, that, I think that that's the thing that comes off that people get from him. And he actually says it like, I hate everybody. He's, he, there's quotes of him saying like, no, I hate everybody equally. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. It's just like, oh, well, that's demonic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just and the that... hatred of mankind. So, so his message is, if you will be willing to hate everyone, you will be rewarded materially. And is that not selling your soul to, yes, to the devil? Like, isn't that exactly what selling your soul to the devil would be? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and again, I, man, it's just funny because uh, I was, I saw some little quip from kind of like ortho bro type of situation thing. It was kind of mocking people who are like trying to really, I took it as people, as kind of like a mocking of people who are really trying to maintain a real path. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like, essentially this thing is like, you know, we should just vanquish our enemies. I mean, he might as well just said that, whatever. But like, the thing about that is, this is why it becomes so difficult is because the message of our Lord is antithetical to that. You have to love your enemies. Saint Silouan, the Athenite, he says, if if one doesn't love their enemies, the grace of God is not with is not with them. I mean, that's pretty black and white. That's straightforward. That that's pretty black and white. And and again, like I was saying earlier, the the revelation of of the Christ that comes from our elders is one of a radical humility that is otherworldly. It, it, isn't, it isn't Gandhi, it isn't all these people. It's, Gandhi's a proud man, you know what I mean? Like throw someone at me, I'm gonna tell you, he's a proud man. Christ is humble. Christ is humility. And, and he's the one who's beckoning us, right? And so, yeah, okay, I get it. You know, you gotta, you know, I don't know, you got to survive, I guess, whatever that means. But like, is he God or is he not? Is there an afterlife or is there not? Like, this is the problem with um, the right and, you know, the sons of Pierce and all that stuff is like, the religious trapping is one thing, but like, do you really believe? Do you really believe? Like, yeah, and what like, does that mean? Like, what, does that what mean? is the like, scope of that belief? Like, we talk, we've talked about this before. It's like, you know, those those priests being like do you believe yes boom do you believe yes boom and they're and you know one in front of the other like so many stories like that's why the the blood of mars is the seat of the church because the fundamental refusal to do anything but be a disciple of jesus christ which is the beatitudes which is this absolutely ridiculous radical way of it's a completely antithetical radical way of living your life but what's interesting is once you enter into it you're like oh this is life everything else is it this is what's crazy yeah using that's... women using women for my pleasure that's actually crazy yeah you know what i mean hating people just because whatever that's crazy that there's yeah, no just... there's no life in that there's no light in that, right? The, so like the transformation of that, Father, too, is it's like, because that's the other part about this. Forgive me, but it's just like, I, it has to be said is that like, it's been like for me, Andrew Tate appearing on the scene has been this weird thing where I've like looked and been like, yes, I was there. And I also look and I'm like, for sure, I don't know who that person was. Mm -hmm. Like, I know I was there, but I can't even get my, I've tried. I've sat down and actually tried, like, let me put myself back in that. And I cannot put myself back in that mindset. Mm -hmm. It's like it, it I, I can't. It's like there's a block. There's now, a and forgive me, I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to say something. You're, you're saying something that's really important right here. People, you remember, um, um, I, I won't name him, but you'll know what I'm saying. Remember your first, remember catechism and who was in there with you? Yep, yep, and remember yep, how he yep. was just, 
he couldn't yep. wrap his mind yep. around like yep. how do you know you're not saved how can you you know yep. what i mean yep it's like this is that's it right there what you're talking about i can't even wrap my mind around thinking even thinking about doing something like that right that type of change on an ontological fundamental level that's the encounter of, that's the encounter of the christ it's not a head game it, it it doesn't make sense in the sense of like you know therapy right it's 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 a completely different situation and i had to stop right there because once you 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 can't even give a valid argument or explanation to anyone because they won't get it they'll be like that's just your your religious not or like the whatever expression to undermine and to marginalize you they don't believe it they, they i, can't I believe honestly it. believe that they just, yeah they can't they, they can't, can't believe it, believe it. Yeah, they yeah, can't yeah. believe it that that's the key they can't believe it right and so it's only until you enter into that which is i i feel like i might have zoned out during the conversation at that point forgive me i think that's kind of what you guys were talking about in regards of like you got to you got to kind of do the thing first and then it comes along. I think that was part of what you yeah. guys were riffing on. Um, hey, I don't blame you. It was me talking. I zone out a lot when I'm talking too. Hey, you know, I mean, Abraham, right? God doesn't show up and reveal himself to Abraham until after he obeys. Like that's a principle. Mm. That's a, that's a principle, right? It's like, no, no, no. You do the thing first, man, and then it'll come along, right? That's, I mean, that's how it works. So well, you, you have to go to the place before the thing happens, right? It's like, if, if somebody says, oh, well, you know, whatever, the, the, I, I'm, I'm, it's out here and it's like, yo, when the tide comes in, there's this crazy like thing, it goes in and the blowhole goes up and they're like, show me. Mm -hmm. It's like, I can't show you. Yeah. Yeah. You have to go to the play. You actually have to make the effort to go to you the have place. To. I'll tell you what, it, it's it's one of those things too where like um okay, the whole thing about being a spiritual father, right? And then like, you know, um yes, monasticism, but even like, you know, it's not like monastics are just monastics are Christians who are living the gospel out to the fullest of, of its capability right okay so it's not like what they do isn't for everyone else right but in a different expression are you following me okay so there's this whole thing about getting a blessing right someone will come and like okay father is this blessed blah 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 well i just want to go in this real quick because if people can understand that a blessing isn't about permission there's maybe a component to that there's a component to like okay but what you really have to understand is like the the blessing is like yes enter into the divine order yes enter into because the priest the spiritual father blesses because the vantage point right there's so many things that are happening right uh you know if sister comes in and she's like is it blessed for me to take the car to go get whatever and i'm like no it's not blessed right this is just practical on a practical level because there's all these other moving pieces where I'm like, no, if you do this right now, it's going to mess up all this other stuff, right? Order, harmony, harmony, right? That's one level. That's a very practical, tangible, almost like psychological level. But there's another level underneath it, which I want to talk about. And that's this. It's an invitation into that divine experience of God's of, of God's order of, and God's ability to manifest and manifest through potentiality. Here, here's what I mean by that. One of the things that will happen often with people is like, I got a problem, father, blah, 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 right? Once someone comes to me and says, I got a problem, blah, 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 there's gonna be one of two things that are gonna happen. I'm going to tell them what they need to do. And they're either going to be like, okay, great, maybe blessed, whatever, or they're not. Okay. What's great is either way, God's will is going to be 
revealed in their life you, to some degree, you know what I'm saying? But what's great is, and the nuns will tell you this, when they just humble down, when it, it, not the nuns, anyone will tell you, if, you, if I just listened to what Father said, blah, 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 and it, it worked out. It didn't make sense. And it didn't make sense at the time. And I was mad at him because he doesn't understand, blah, blah, blah. But I just entered into it. And then eventually it worked out, right? Why is that? Is it because it's not, it has nothing to do with me, right? The blessedness is entering into that awareness, that communion, that participation, and, and the wonder, the wisdom of God working in, in, our, in that potential. You understand what I'm saying? It's like being a cog, it, being cool with being a cog. It is, it is. It is the direct, tangible experience of that. That's the true mystical. That's, that's the true mystical. When you enter into blessing, right? The blessing of the Lord. And you start seeing how God works everything to our, to our benefit, right? Blessing. And, and when something's blessed, that's the, the on-ramp into that. And it's, it's sad because... For a lot of people who are entering into, the, into orthodoxy, you know, I mean, you understand this, Andrew, people will spend years sometimes on the superficial level of being, you know, their, their experience of orthodoxy consists of talking about history, let's say, sure. or like, you know, fundamental, like, doctrine, or like theology, you're like, and, they're, and I get that. It's just like, you're just trying to shake off the fact that like, Oh, so Mary is a real thing. And like, you know what I mean? I, I get that. But once yeah. there's a whole nother level underneath that, where it's like, you don't even, you're not even thinking about those things anymore. You're like operating on a level of like temptation and like experiencing God's incredible, like grace of like, you know, talk about the butterfly effect. Everything is, no. you're, waking up, you're waking up to God, like orchestrating or, or excuse me, not orchestrating using the most minutest of like variants and he uses that and you, and you sit back and you're like wow that's that's blessed that's blessed you know what i mean totally i mean i remember when i first entered the church i remember that um i had just come off of uh, my summer of hallucinogens and so i was really into this idea of like of like trying to understand god's will and all things and trying to like look back and see god's will and how he was using that stuff to kind of help me and everything and i was the concept of something bad happening to me being a blessing like was totally beyond me it was totally 100 beyond me but i mean even just looking at it from a pretty practical and what is the church and god if not extremely practical but like looking at it from like a practical level, like there was times in my life where like I really wanted something mm -hmm. and I didn't get it and I was crushed. And just like later on being like, that would have been a really bad idea. Really bad. Like, you know, like a bad idea. Like I wanted to, like in early recovery, I wanted to be like a sous chef. And I was like all excited about the restaurant cooking scene. And then like I woke up when it was like, I hate this. Mm -hmm. I don't want this for my career. I don't want this life for me. And you know, that's not what I do anymore. No. So, I mean, uh, uh, so anyway, it, I got to a point where it just broke my mind where it, it, I'm talking about back when I first entered the church, like we're taking a couple of years back. I'm back when I entered the church and I, it was me trying to kind of put some perspective and understanding on some of the things that had happened. And I just remember like at a certain point, I just like, I got to stop like trying to figure out i gotta stop trying to contain this like i can't i can't be comfortable i can't like da, 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 da. this was god doing this put the cap on the like the bottle right like date and time it be like this was god's providence and then putting it up on the shelf on like a like a light neatly like stacked row of bottles where i'm understanding each little thing that's happening it really came down to this like perspective of just being like because in and of itself that that tactic is a measure of control like i'm trying to control like what's happening to me you know i'm trying to control i'm trying to keep in like a perspective where things can still kind of make sense to me and that'll never turn out 
That's what I'm saying. And there was true relief and true blessed, like true blessing when I let that go. And I can tell you, this is my end of my rambling story. It all kind of came to a head where, and I remember I was living at what is now a wonderful, lovely Orthodox school for children. And I was living and it was not that at the time. And I remember my cat had got out. And at the time I had nothing else to worry about except the stupid cat. So I was all worried about my cat being out. And I remember like, I was trying so hard to like practice, like making my will come true, you know, like, like low key magic, you know, I was like, cause I thought that my, that was my experience with God. I had to ask and beg enough times to get God to do what I wanted. And transactional, transactional. It, yeah. It was very transactional. It was very like punishing. It was very like, I just have to ask in a very intense way. And I can't feel good at any time because if I feel good, a punishment's going to come, you know, like, Mm-hmm. no love no relationship just totals i am a slave to a master yeah. I, i'm a slave to a master i hate and um i was standing uh on my front porch in a robe and like pajamas and smoking a cigarette because i smoked at the time i was smoking a newport cigarette staying outside and i remember this the first moment of like what I thought was depression at the time, but it was like acceptance of being like, she's going to come back or she's not mm-hmm. that the stupid cat. And it's like, went back inside. Lo and behold, five minutes later, she walked back in the door. Like it was this total moment of just being like, there's nothing I can do. There's just, I can ask and he gives it if he wants to. And if he doesn't, or if it's beneficial for me. Mm-hmm. And the same thing happened. Like two months later, I was walking in a dark field, my cross, my baptismal cross fell off in the field. We're in a huge field. It's like midnight. And I'm like, I'm never going to find this thing. And like, it was like, I'm going to find it or I'm not. Two minutes later, somebody found it. And it was just like, boop, here you go. And it's just yeah, like, I mean, I, I'll tell you this much. I, I don't want to get into all the details, but my darkest moment, I was just talking with Papati about this two nights ago. One of my darkest moments, um, and I mean, it, it was more painful than like the death of my parents at the, at the time. So I, I think I'd say something. Uh, man, I'm so glad it happened. Because if it hadn't happened, I wouldn't be in Kansas City. I would have been in a whole nother church, and like all this stuff, you know what I mean? And it's like, that's why, you know, again, I, I can look someone in the eye and be like, your worst day, if you really have faith, meaning if you really trust God, you could get like, your worst day can actually be the thing that ends up saving your life. I'm, I'm living proof of it. My worst, that, my worst day where I thought everything was crashing in on me, everything I'd worked, like my first real like pain in the church, right? Because the church is everything to me, right? That, I mean, I thank God for that day. That's a, that's a, that's, that's evidence of Christ in my life, that cross, like that, that whole season, that dark time, man, like you, I couldn't, I couldn't put a price on. Well, you, you got four flat tires and a blown head gasket, but had you not, had you kept going 20 feet forward, you would have gone off a thousand foot cliff. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. You know, so you're sitting there like, I can't believe this. Four flat tires and my car is wrecked. Like, yeah. I can't believe this. And it's like, there's literally a cliff yeah. that you are about to go off. I, right it's there. so. I mean, I've had that so many times in my life now looking the back. biggest, The biggest, if not the biggest, but one of the biggest thorns in my side is my alcoholism. But I mean, I can tell you that like one of, okay, here's Andrew. But like, I can tell you this, that there's a whole line of comics where Bruce Banner gets separated from the Hulk. They become two separate entities. And guess what happens to Bruce Banner? He becomes a jerk. He goes entirely off into his own thing and just like, because he lost his cross of constantly trying to keep himself in control. He has to stay humble and stay low. And like, I remember like this whole time when I first started working with father as like my spiritual father. And I think he was still a deacon at the time. Of just like the blackest depression. Like I think some of the, like the blackest depression of just like 
because it was so much forced smiling in my recovery and everything. And I got to this point of just like real black. And I am so grateful I got to that point because like when that happened is when I was finally like, I don't have to fake like this anymore. I can like experience the fullness of reality. And I was just telling someone like uh, whatever earlier today at work, I was like, I absolutely, because they're talking, interestingly enough, the topic tonight of one of the classes I was teaching was forgiveness. And I was like, I, I, I absolutely, this lady was like, I'm not going to take people back into my life because every time they do, they hurt me. And I was like, so you're keeping your walls up at all times, right? You know, she's like, yeah, I was like, essentially what you're trying to do, blah, 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 summarizing. I was just like, you're essentially trying never to feel pain again. And like, you can't do that because that's not life. And then I do this whole thing where I draw a circle and I'm like, this is the fullness of home, human emotion. You're trying to stay at the top 30%. It's not cool. It's a totally numb, sterile way of living. And it sucks. I've done it. And like that breaking of that line and like letting all the liquid goosh and fill up the whole circle and feel like all the pain, like that's what lets me know I'm alive. Like that is like oftentimes the times in which like someone runs up and stabs me with the spear in my side to let the water and blood out that's when i know like i'm alive that's well, the thing like, is the, th the thing is that's kind of part of why we're so messed up is we don't want to experience what it means to be human and we don't have to we're given all of the tools you don't have to 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 let oh you're you're thinking about something you don't want to think about here's a distraction oh you're feeling something you don't want to feel here's a distraction here's another way to feel real quick mm -hmm. right uh, 24 hours a day mm -hmm. 24 hours no hours silence no it, silence whatsoever yeah yeah people what's crazy is people um they become christian they become orthodox they they, they come to the church they unfortunately if if they <laughs> you know being facetious if they actually find a spiritual father that will help them it becomes difficult because the spiritual father will push you because you're not going to really get it. You're not going to, you're not, you never will really enter into a Eucharistic experience until you embrace that silence, until you embrace that, that space. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You won't, you just, there is no other way around it. Everything else is very flat and false. It's only in that space of the silence of quote unquote God that you begin to make that transformation. I mean, and that that was essential for me because I thought so much it was just like bearing it, bearing it, bearing it. And again, it seems like it's these always these mundane moments. I'm talking a lot about myself and I apologize, but there's this mundane moments that like there were these spiritual principles become concrete. And I had screwed up at work and I, and this is a long time ago, the different job. And I remember being like, Which, by the way, that's key. The mundanity of it. Yeah. Like that's the thing that people really, that's why so many people, they don't get it. That that's one of the biggest obstacles from someone transitioning out of being, having like a secular Protestant american mindset and actually becoming orthodox is the embracing of, of the mundane yeah. because they come into it and the newness and the exoticness of orthodoxy is fine and even that bit that can maybe tickle there's a couple of things people's intellect feels like it's getting tickled because orthodoxy can be a very intellectual thing right or their insecurity as a man gets tickled oh, this is a manly thing. And I'm like a man. And like, I think Jordan Peterson said this is manly. You know what I mean? Like they, they come into that, you know? Ortho bro guy says this is manly. Okay, that gets tickled, right? Um, like, oh, this is, you know, the kind of the, I mean, the virtue signaling. And like, oh, this is where I can like have a, a real mystical experience with my like bleeding heart, blah, blah, blah. Like all the, po all the poles get tickled, but they all also fall apart under the weight of the actual praxis mm -hmm. of the church, which is mundane. The day in because day out. the honeymoon phase goes away and the, and the hump period comes in and it's like, okay, the reality is, is it's not sexy anymore. It's not new, it's not shiny, right? Like you're not really that much more of a man. You know what I mean? 
you're not really, you know, that much more intellectual. In fact, it's it's become a problem. What now? And you're so, oh, so it's really just praying. Oh, I have to confess again. Like, yeah, that's where the change happens. It's in those spaces of the mundane. But we don't we don't like that. And that's why people, you know, they peace out or they or they find these weird things. Oh, you know, whatever accusation, false accusation gets thrown out because it's it's all projection. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's back that's back to your quote about the self-righteousness. Mm-hmm. about someone who says i'm not going to do this mundane work mm-hmm. that's the mundane work right oh. i'm not going to do this work because if i do it i'm going to become self-righteous if i'm fasting if i'm praying if i'm you know giving alms i'm doing these things mund in a mundane way oh no then i'm going to become self-righteous and it's like oh no then you're going to realize i'm not smart i'm not more of a man you're not i'm not these things i'm i'm t- and, and so that, and that's the quote right there that it's like, no, actually you don't understand how self-righteous you already are. Right. And to even think enough, that. that. That you even think that interestingly enough, you end up doing those things. Yeah. Exactly. On a long journey, first there is trees, then there is no trees. And then at the end of the journey, there are trees. trees. Right. That, well, that's what that is. Yeah. Father James always called it the, you, you got delivered out of Egypt. You saw the miracle, the Red Seas were parted, you went across, now you're in your 40 years in the desert. Mm-hmm. Like that's and what is a desert, but trekking around looking for oasis isn't looking for. The manna still comes. Guess what? You grumble. Mm-hmm. The good stuff comes, but you still grumble. Like you're making your way to Mount Sinai. Like just take it easy. And um, but what what ended up happening at that that work thing was that um was I just was like, you got to bear it because something was screwed up at work. I was going to have to stay late, blah, blah, blah. And I just was like that honesty of being like, what did I do to deserve this? You know, like actually like yelling, you know, for like a second, I, you know, I didn't try to be disrespectful. But I was like, I, I was careful. I was careful. What did I do? And like that then broke that damn broke. And I was able to finally, it felt like I could be a little bit more honest with God instead of like, things being sent my way and me just like smiling and be like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. And God's like, I I mean, I know it's not. So, you know, just be honest with me. So, uh, so, well, this is this, this, you know, what, what it makes, what it makes me think. And it's, I have a particular appreciation for, for the mundane, I think. And I just wonder if maybe there's, Maybe the maybe my greatest blessing is the the time in which things happened in my life because I think that if I was Andrew Tate, and things were happening in my life at this time, oh, like because it almost feels like we're in a. I'm getting this. I, I don't know how to articulate this. I was very much able to hit rock bottom, like a spiritual rock bottom, you know, like experience the highest of highs that's even beyond things that I would have imagined for myself, go full blast at it in the worldly sense and experience an absolute spiritual rock bottom because of that. But it's like, I feel like the way that things are set up right now, it's almost impossible for someone reaching a certain height to ever hit a spiritual rock bottom. It's almost like you fall a little bit and then there's this thing, you know, like Andrew Tate is canceled from everything, but Tucker Carlson interviews him right? Like you, there's no way there's every, there's all of these demonic things to like, you're falling, falling. And it's like, boing, like on a little spring yeah. and you just keep going, 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 just degrading the whole time. Yeah. The demonic trampoline. Yeah. Like That's he, well, what well, it feels like. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I mean, in, in a weird way, in a weird way, it's like, um, the devils will like pad everything. You know what I mean? Because again, this is that this that weird this that weird thing where um, <laughs> it's it's interesting. I was just talking with the sisters about this uh, uh, this week. There's a whole thing where people will. No, I've had this happen. Um, 
you don't even know God. You're not a priest. You, you're mean. Or like, fill in the blank of like, there's this whole thing. Because they have this vision of, of Christ where Jesus is always like, at any cost, you know, no pain for you, right? No, you, but that's the demons. That's the that's demonic the demon. trampoline. Exactly. Yeah. You experience my love because there's no hard word for you. And there's no, you know what I mean? That's some people's real, that's some people's, they have antichrist. That's what they have. And so by extension of that, it's like, you give them a hard word. You, you're, you don't have love. Blah, 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 blah. And it's like, they don't know. No, that actually is love. And, then, and it isn't just, I'm not just taking some excuse to get my jollies off and be rude, mm-hmm. you know? Like, you don't know what love is, right? It's like the petulant child who just thinks that their daddy's the worst because he's like, don't play with that knife. You know what I mean? Father Stephen DeYoung said that one time. He was talking about a particular the scripture where christ was yelling at some people um and uh he was like listen to how unchrist like christ is being (laughs) yeah yeah so yeah i mean i mean that's that's really a thing and the inverse of that obviously is the demons are really uh they like to pat it because i mean isn't that what happens when people slide into addiction it's only until it's only until it's like you're really in a bad space where you're really entrapped that like the pain starts to hit you. But by that point in time, it's kind of like, it's, it, it's not the same. All the pain that would have warned you along the way to say, this is, I should not be going down this path. It's like, they work really hard at padding that. They right. toss girls at you or guys, whatever, you know, all these things get tossed at you to get you thinking, oh, this is, this is okay. This is okay. You know what I mean? They really do pat it. And the whole time, God's like, when I, when, I, when I look back on those bad seasons of my life, I see God's hand in those things that I was running from, actually. You know what I mean? I mean, and not only that, but like, that's, I think that's so much of the step work. I don't know. But is walking that back. It's like walking those rationalizations back to get back to the point where it's like, well, I feel really bad about doing this. I'm like, well, you should. That was a pretty messed up thing for you to do. Like, it wasn't okay for you to steal $300 from your dying grandma or whatever, or steal all her pain pills, you know, when she's dying of cancer or whatever. That's not good. So feel bad. Right. Yeah, it's not going to be made okay. There's right. not going to be a time when this is made okay, but it, but that's part of the that's part of the point, right? Like, if the point is to surrender, it's like okay, well, I, I obviously I can't do this. Well, remember what we were saying earlier about selling your soul, right? Yeah, that's it's the opposite. It's that's how you maintain and and actually you grow and deepen your soul. That's how it's through that pain. That's how you, the father's talking about enlarging the heart. That's how that happens, right? The pain is how you become a person that has a soul, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, gentlemen. Yep. Uh, I don't have much to say about a saint other than I'm reading a book um, by uh, St. Nikolai Velomirovich, and I wanted to read a quote to you guys really quick. If you could vamp for just one second. Please. Uh, What's the name of the book, by the way? It is uh, just Missionary Letters of Part Missionary One. Missionary Letters of St. Nikolai Velomirovich. Yeah. Which, by um, way, if anyone gets a chance, that's like we, we sometimes call it the pink set. Pink and there's set. a whole, it's a whole. This one right here of um serbian spirituality <sighs> everything in that set is incredible there's a book if if nothing else everyone out there get this book and you're welcome um it's called the uh, mystical meaning of the battle of kosovo that thing um, yeah man that thing's got some crazy nuggets in it he is he, 
I'm a I'm a guy who appreciates a good writer. As since I was little, I've appreciated a good, well structured sentence. And this is one of the things that attracts me to St. John Chrysostom one, and then of course St. Nikolai Vladimirovich, because he has this way of just like casually just like just dropping these like really profound things like between sentences. Like he'll be talking, he'll say something, and he'll just throw this little nugget in and then keep moving on. And you're like, like, what? Yeah. And I hyper it's like father, we were talking about um Eagle Twin mm -hmm. a long time ago, and they had these riffs. Oh yeah. But they'll only play it for like four seconds. Oh yeah, the Eagle Twin. Movious, coolest Man. riff. Ever, never come back to it. And Andrew, God bless you. I'm I'm so Eagle Twin. I'm so, Eagle Twin. Eagle but this is kind of silly, but it was funny. I just, but it basically, it's a letter, it's a letter to a guy who says being a, um, being a patriotic Serb is enough. I don't need faith. Like <laughs> faith is not, you know, but being a patriotic Serb. And then of course he goes through and he names all these Serbian saints. So like, yeah, be like them. You know, that's how you be a Serbian. And then at the end he said, um, so don't wish for a serve done without substance. May a, man, may a mindless man never be your guide, nor a faithless serve your comrade. And I was just like, goodness <laughs> gracious, this guy. Like, I would get that tattooed on my forehead. But he, um, I don't know. He, he, it's blowing my mind. I, I usually struggle to read, and rightly so, struggle to read holy books. You know, rightly show it should be difficult. Like if it, you know, if I'm in a place where I'm like, I'm just like pouring through this stuff, like sometimes that can be feeding my ego, yeah. but like um, this, like I usually like set out with the way that I try and set out, well, we're just going to pray the Trisagion tonight, kind of just like tricking myself because then when I'm at the end of the Trisagion, it's not an obligation, but love that keeps me praying. Um, it's like, I was like, I'm only going to read like five letters. But I was just like pouring because each letter, each like title is like the two friends who are debating whether um, those who should be ill should be given communion to educate a girl about the five wounds of Christ. Uh, the retiree SP who replains the Chinese Japanese war in his own way. And he's just like constant. Oh, this is the best part. He was talking about this woman in World War One. Um, a mother could not find the grave of her son. And he was talking about this mother. He was he was talking to this woman about her, you know, couldn't find a, gra a son of her grave, a grave of her son. Um, and he's like, so there's this woman I knew in World War One who um, her husband was killed right in front of their house, like shot dead. Um, and she and her five children, mind you, five children, so a widow and now five or, or five people without a, a a father, have to run all the way across Europe to try and find safety. So they go to prisons, they're like working, they have to like travel all through these hardships, starvation, lack of sleep, freezing, heat, all this different stuff. And then he just kind of ends it. He was just like, yeah, I'd rather hear that story any day of the week than all of Napoleon's conquests. And I was just like, dude, yes, exactly. You nailed it. And like, of course he nailed it. He's the Chris Austin of Serbia, but it was just fantastic. So that's great. Yeah, and he's my son's saint. So Love it. that's great. Yeah. Love and it. the icon that was written about him is what connected Cyprian to our church, I think. I think because as the way the story goes, I think you commented, it doesn't matter. It's all a long time ago. But anyway, he's incredible. Like he's a guy that like every time I see him, I know it's gonna be good. And it's the same with the prologue. Every time I read the prologue, it's just like it's never bad. It's never like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's not. I mean, his words are never, ever bad. And like I was talking with my buddy Katakim and Nathan the other day about this. And I was like, I just love how much this dude just talks mad crap on the world. He's just like, yeah, good luck with all of your education. It'll be a sand before God, but it can't even be sand because what is sand without God? It doesn't exist. And he's just like basically talking about your stupid, stupid ways of thinking. Your 80, like prayers by the lake. He's just constant, like extremely well-educated man, just like tearing down academia. Just being like, this is, oh, it is so, you guys just love your minds. You love <laughs> your minds, but it will mean nothing. It'll be nothing. 
like before too long it'll be not trust the science trust the science i know anyway yeah i keep going what really argue against is i i represent science Right. Did you see that? Right, yeah, yeah, no, I am science. I am science. If, science. if you if you if you say something against me, you're not saying something against me. You're saying something against science. Unreal. There's a certain like weird fervency around that time and in, in our history. I remember reading that headline at like five o'clock in the morning and be like, "This is like fever pitch." Yeah. He could not get away with this at any other time than right now. No. 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 Everything. Well, speaking what of co- order, what, co- what the pendulum is swinging though, and what comes next, there'll be another fever pitch. It'll just look very different. It, I know it, this is like the whole Andrew needs two hours to get going, so I'll stop after this. But like, there just there needs to be the structure behind all of this stuff because we could not have got to the point with Mister Blah 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 saying that if we had not had the structure to build us to a point where the masses were like ready to accept it. Because if he just come out cold and been like in like say like 2019 or whatever, and be like, I am the voice of science, then there would have been dissent throughout the entire there would have been schism within the religion of scientism, you know? But like then we got to this point and like not only that, but like we're speaking of being broken down to the point where like we can actually truthfully say, like, let your will be done. Like there's all these structures that had to be put in place to get us there. There has to be this like. I don't know. It's like it's like a it's like a machine. It, it's not a machine, but, but it's like this like it's this way of. And being. if you want to know if you want to know how this those structures got built, just check out our last episode, naming the powers. Yeah, <laughs> Ephesians six right. twelve. Right. We're just gonna leave it with that. We're gonna leave it with that. So, um, uh, okay, we have the merch store, royalpath dot yep. store. Yep. Okay. Um, we also have the playlist on Spotify, and while we were talking earlier i added all the songs we talked about nice. to the playlist um feel free to write uh, emails i've been trying to get better about getting back to emails quicker i've linked it to my phone so that as soon as you guys send one to me i get it so i've been trying to get better now especially now that my wife's at the baby and then um we're back on spotify we're up to date with all of our episodes and everything except they well, what's your email what's your email so they know oh i'm so sorry andrew at royalpath.network dot network dot network andrew at royalpath.network yeah please send anything you can to me and then i'll filter through and if i think father needs to see it or if you specifically asked i'll send it to father or cyprian um and we'll just take it from there so anyway thank you for having a good night bye-bye <laughs>